Hey, what's up you guys? Thanks for joining me. I'm happy to announce that we finally hit a thousand subscribers, so I just want to take a second to say thank you for all of your support. I honestly never thought I would get to this point. So all of you guys that have been supporting me and encouraging me, you guys are awesome. All right, so today we're gonna to be discussing a very bizarre case that unfortunately has never been fully resolved. Thankfully, no one lost their life, but it's still a very sad case that I feel needs recognition. There are many victims in this case, and sadly, many of them are minors. A lot of the people involved in this case have chosen to remain anonymous, but the general story really should be told so that we can prevent something like this from happening again. Even though this is such a huge case with over 70 victims, we're going to be discussing one particular incident involving a young woman named Louise Ogborn, and we'll talk about her more a little later. I first discovered this case after I watched a movie called Compliance, and when I realized this really happened, I knew I needed to cover it on my channel. I definitely recommend watching the movie, but just like my last case, they definitely glossed over some things that I want to talk about. Essentially, this case stemmed from a series of prank calls, and though most of us consider prank calls to be harmless fun, this caller took it to another level. He was seriously perverse. He was a predator, and there were many that fell victim to his sadistic games. These cases show how far some people are willing to go if they believe they're being led by an authority figure, such as a district manager or a police officer. Before we get into Louise's story, I want to go back and talk about some of the other events that occurred. A man who most often referred to himself as Officer Scott began making several prank calls to various restaurants all over the United States. He frequently targeted small rural towns and primarily focused on fast food joints. Most likely he did this because he thought the employees there would be more trusting and willing to give in to his authority. The first incident occurred in Devil's Lake, North Dakota in 1995, and these calls lasted for 10 years. So basically, Officer Scott would call these restaurants and somehow convince the employees to do bizarre things to each other. He targeted those areas and he did his research. This caller would find the names of regional managers or other employees so that when he made the call, he could easily manipulate people and make them believe he was the real deal. He would tell them that he was working with the local police department and convince them that their regional managers were expecting them to follow his orders. Once he had them on the phone, he'd convince employees, including managers, to perform strip searches on each other, among other strange and bizarre things. There were 70 confirmed cases of this happening, and he would call up to 10 stores a day. The man would use calling cards and pay phones to pull these scams, which of course made it very difficult for the police to track him down. In November of 2000, Officer Scott called a McDonald's in Litchfield, Kentucky, and asked to speak to a manager. Once she was on the phone, he convinced her that one of the customers in the restaurant was a sexual predator and asked her to undress in front of him so she could bait him. The manager was told that the entire restaurant was under surveillance and that once the customer tried to assault her, they would rush in and arrest him. Because the manager was being led by a police officer, and believed that it was the right thing to do, she followed the caller's instructions, only to discover that it was all one big hoax. The police were called, and when asked why she did this, she told them she believed that he was a real police officer. He talked the talk, and he walked the walk. He knew what to say to manipulate her and get her to conform. These calls only continued, and they grew more and more disgusting. In each call, Officer Scott would convince the employees to either strip or make someone else strip. As he gained more experience with these calls and got more comfortable, they escalated beyond just strip searches. And that's when he brought full-on sexual acts into the mix. Each time local police were made aware of the call, but because they were spread out in over 30 states, none of them were really aware that it was going on elsewhere. They basically just believed it was an isolated incident or just a few incidents, rather than a serial scammer. In May of 2002, a young woman began her first ever shift at a McDonald's in Roosevelt, Iowa. It was her 18th birthday when she was forced to strip down, jog naked around the store, 
and pose for people all at the direction of an anonymous caller. In January of 2003, a collect call was placed to an Applebee's located in Davenport, Iowa. The caller asked to speak to the manager that was working at the time. Once he was on the phone, the caller told the manager that he was the regional manager, despite it being a collect call. And he claimed that one of the waitresses that had been working was stealing from the store. He said that she needed to be searched while he stayed on the phone and listened. The male assistant manager then proceeded to conduct a strip search that lasted over an hour and a half. It was later discovered that Appleby sent out a memo regarding an issue with prank calls. The assistant manager had not only received that letter, but also read it. When the police asked him why he listened to what the caller said, he said that he had just forgotten about the memo and that he thought it was his regional manager, which again called collect. In June of 2003, Officer Scott called a Taco Bell located in Juneau, Alaska, and he claimed that he was a detective working with the Taco Bell Corporation to investigate some type of drug use going on in the workplace. Somehow, the caller twisted the situation and convinced the manager working to bring a very, very young female customer into his office, strip her down, and force her to perform lewd acts. By this point, this faceless man had become a master manipulator. He could easily convince people to do things that were completely out of character for them. He sounded professional. He did his research, so he knew what to say. He always got familiar with the town that he was calling before he would call. Anything that he could do to make himself sound more legitimate, he did. It seems like this almost became an obsession for him. He would call up to 10 stores a day with calling cards, which I assume aren't cheap. He would stay on the phone for hours. He dedicated a lot of time into researching these people and the town. Most of the people that were coached into doing these things felt that it was wrong or strange, yet they did it anyway because they feared facing any repercussions. One Hardy's manager that strip searched a female employee under the instruction of this caller said in court that he did not want to be doing those things, but felt like the caller was watching him. That man actually spent over a month in jail before being acquitted of rape and kidnapping charges. According to court documents, some of the managers would actually break down and start crying as they were being forced to conduct these searches because they were so sadistic. However, these pranks also brought out the worst in some people. It seemed as if some of these managers actually enjoyed doing these things like it was some sort of fun power trip. At a Burger King in Pendleton, Indiana, Officer Scott convinced a manager to perform a strip search on a young female employee. When her father arrived to pick her up, he had to physically jump over the counter and assault the manager in order to get him to let his daughter go. These situations that I'm describing are just a few of the incidents. Remember, this happened over 70 times that we know of, and there could be even more that have gone unreported. Let's talk about Louise Ogborn. Louise Ogborn was an 18-year-old girl living in Mount Washington, Kentucky. She was set to graduate high school the following month and had plans to attend the University of Louisville with hopes to go into the medical field. But her family had recently fallen on hard times, so Louise decided to take a part-time job at McDonald's. She began working there as a cashier in December of 2003. Louise was described as your average teenager. She attended church and was a former Girl Scout. People say she was very sweet, trustworthy, and friendly. The fact that she was willing to put her goals on hold just so that she could help her family out really says a lot about her character. She wanted to go into the medical field and she wanted to bring goodness into the world. And Louise loved her family so much. Sadly, her decision to take the job at McDonald's would flip Louise's life upside down just four months later when she became one of Officer Scott's victims. On April 9, 2004, which was a Friday, Louise went in and worked a mid-morning shift. She had a normal day and was just about to clock out when the assistant manager asked her if she could stay and work the evening shift. Someone had called in and they were short a person so they really needed her help. Even though she really wanted to go home, Louise needed the extra money so she agreed to stay and work another shift. During the dinner rush, the store received a call from a man claiming to be a detective. 
He asked to speak to the manager that was on duty about a theft that apparently occurred at their location. There were actually two assistant managers working at the time. The first being 51 year old Donna Summers and the other was a woman named Kim. Donna was the one that went back to the office to take the call and it was then that the man introduced himself. He told her that his name was Officer Scott and he was a local detective. He said that he received a report from a customer that came into the restaurant and she was claiming that one of the cashiers stole from her purse. The detective then told Donna that he had her district manager, whom he called by name, and corporate on the other line. And he said they were already aware of the situation and were cooperating with him. He then described a young cashier that seemingly matched Luis's description. Officer Scott then asked Donna if she could help him out. He said that there was some type of raid going on and he wasn't going to send an officer there just yet. Donna was shocked by these allegations, but she agreed to bring Louise into her office and interrogate her anyway. He told Donna to hold her there until the police arrived, but to stay on the phone with him and follow his instructions. Once Louise got into Donna's office, she was completely stunned. She obviously knew she was innocent and was truly afraid that she was going to get in trouble for something that she didn't do. Obviously, she denied the officer's allegations and initially was very willing to cooperate. Donna was then told to have Louise empty her pockets and she confiscated her phone, purse, keys, and ID. Though she was terrified, Louise willingly handed over all of her personal belongings. And this is when Donna was instructed to perform a strip search to ensure that Louise wasn't hiding anything under her uniform. Donna and Louise were then presented with an ultimatum. He said that Donna could either strip search her there or that he would have to send someone down to arrest Louise, book her into the jail, and perform the search there. Obviously, she didn't want to be arrested, so she submitted to what Donna asked her to do. This is when Kim, the other manager, came in to be a witness to the search because she knew that would be corporate policy. Once the three of them were locked in the office, they had Louise undress and she was shaking and crying through the whole ordeal. When she got down to her undergarments, Donna told her to remove those as well. Once Louise was completely nude, the detective told Donna to place her clothes and personal items into a trash bag and take them to her vehicle. He told Donna to place them in the front seat with the door unlocked, claiming that this was standard procedure and they would collect the items when they arrived. So Louise had to stand in front of her managers completely nude with only a small dirty apron to cover herself until they were able to send someone down there. The detective warned Donna not to let any of the other employees know what was going on because it could hurt the investigation. Naturally, Louise was a complete and utter mess. She was so, so upset and was sobbing uncontrollably. Louise later stated that she obviously wanted to run out of the office and try to get help, but was too humiliated to be nude in front of complete strangers like most of us would be. The restaurant continued to get busier and busier by the minute. Donna was starting to get more and more frustrated by the minute. They had been in the office for over an hour and they all needed to get back on the floor. They were now down three people and things were getting very hectic without those employees. Kim eventually left Donna and Louise in the office by themselves. Donna couldn't understand why it was taking so long to send an officer down there, given that the police station was only a mile away from the restaurant. The officer then asked if she had another employee that could sit and watch Louise. This would allow Donna to get back to her job, and Officer Scott said that she should be with a man anyway so that she wouldn't be able to escape. And that's when Donna instructed 27-year-old Jason Bradley to come and sit with Louise. As I stated earlier, none of the other employees really knew what was going on. So naturally, Jason was pretty shocked when he stepped into the office and discovered Louise standing there completely nude. Within a few minutes, the caller ordered Jason to remove her apron and describe her body for him. Obviously, Jason was completely uncomfortable with this and thankfully refused to listen to what the man was saying. He exited the office and then told Donna to go fly a kite, if you know what I mean. He said that he didn't agree with what was going on and he was not going to follow the detective's orders. Though Jason obviously had an issue with this bizarre situation, he never once attempted to help Louise. 
nor did he call the police because he believed that he had already spoken with the police. The same goes for the other manager, Kim. Donna was growing more and more overwhelmed with the situation. She had Louise in her office naked, crying, and terrified. She had this annoying detective in her ear telling her what to do, and she still had a ton of customers to serve. Donna expressed her frustration and concern about the situation, telling him that he needed to send someone because she had no one in the restaurant that could guard Louise, and she was just too busy to do it herself. Officer Scott continued to be more and more demanding. He was basically stalling Donna as long as he could to keep her on the phone. He then asked her if her husband could come in and keep an eye on Louise. Donna told him that she wasn't married, but she intended to be, and that her fiancé would probably come in and help out. So she called her fiancé and asked if he could come and help her without an explanation. Because that definitely wouldn't go against corporate policy. I'm sorry, but I don't understand how she could possibly think that any of this could be okay. How did she think there was going to be a positive outcome? I don't know. No common sense, I guess. Donna's fiancé was a 43-year-old man named Walter Nix Jr. He was an exterminator, and people described him as a friendly and very good guy. He was normal, whatever that means. He agreed and arrived approximately 15 minutes later. What's up, dude? <laughs> so, like I was saying, Walter agreed and arrived 15 minutes later, unaware of what he would be walking into. When he walked into the office, Louise was still standing there completely nude, and was only covered with the apron. Louise immediately tried to cover herself more so Walter couldn't see her, but unfortunately there wasn't much she could do. Donna briefly explained what was happening to her fiance. She told him that there was a detective on the phone and that Louise was accused of stealing money. And she basically told him to follow whatever Officer Scott told him to do. Never once did he question why she was nude or why he would need to sit and watch her. Donna then left her middle-aged fiancé in her locked office with her 18-year-old female employee. Once Donna exited, Officer Scott wasted no time. He basically repeated what he told Jason to do. He told Walter to have Louise drop her apron so that he could describe her appearance to him. Afterwards, Louise was forced to do jumping jacks so that she would shake anything loose that she may be hiding. He blindly followed the man's instructions for the next two hours. The torment that Louise was suffering through was getting worse by the minute. Donna entered into the office several times over the next two hours, and each time Walter would quickly hand Louise the apron so that she could cover herself, but was told that she better stay quiet or she would face further repercussions. And as soon as Donna would leave the office again, the abuse started all over again. Louise literally begged her to let her out of the office several times. At one point, even asking her to call the police, despite making the abuse even worse for herself. She was desperate to escape, but Donna told her she just had to get over it and she had to wait for the cops to come. During that two hours, Louise was forced to stand on a chair and bend over for Walter. When Louise begged for Walter to stop, he was instructed to hit her on her behind at one point for 10 minutes straight, to the point that she had welts across her entire body. Right around the three hour mark of this investigation, Walter sexually assaulted Louise while Officer Scott listened. Once the assault was over, he was told to give the phone back to Donna and immediately leave the restaurant. As soon as he left, Walter called his best friend and told him that he had done something terrible. So why would you do it then? Donna was highly upset. She didn't fully understand what had taken place and that no police officers have arrived. And now she had to find yet another person to sit with Louise. I think it's safe to say that she didn't have much sympathy for Louise and she was only getting more frustrated as time went on. Basically because the situation was a complete inconvenience to her. At approximately 8.30 p.m., Thomas Sims, who was a maintenance worker at the restaurant, stopped by to pick up a meal for himself. And he's kind of the hero in this story. When he arrived, Donna quickly approached him and asked if he would come and sit with Louise. She told him that she had been accused of stealing from a customer and that she was being detained. He agreed at first, but when he walked into Donna's office, he was completely disturbed. He saw Louise sitting in the office, once again completely nude, aside from the McDonald's apron. 
Not knowing exactly what he was getting himself into, he took the phone from Donna and she quickly exited to get back to work. Once again, Officer Scott went through the same scenario with Thomas. He told him who he was and demanded that Thomas make Louise drop the apron so that he could describe her body. And this man flat out refused. He left the office, went and found Donna, and told her what the man had said. Donna was confused because nothing like that had been said in front of her. And then she went into complete panic mode. With Louise still sitting in the office, vulnerable, afraid, and begging to be set free, Donna finally called her manager that was supposed to be on the other line. Donna told her what was happening, but the manager claimed to be at home asleep and had never spoken to any police officers. Officer Scott had already disconnected the line at that point. Donna immediately notified the Mount Washington police. Detective Buddy Stump was assigned to the case. He initially believed the caller was using a payphone from across the street and was watching everything unfold. However, once he started doing a little bit of research, Detective Stump learned that these calls had been going on for nearly 10 years across 30 states. The silver lining to this is that another McDonald's had received a call like this and used the star 69 feature to see who made the call. Though they were unable to get a name, they determined that the calls originated from a payphone in Panama City, Florida. By the time this nightmare was over, Poor Louise was traumatized and in complete shock. As she was leaving the restaurant, she simply asked Donna if she had to come into work tomorrow. Thankfully, she never returned. Detective Stump began looking over evidence from other police departments. He spoke with a detective in the West Bridgewater Police Department, located in Massachusetts, named Vic Flaherty, who was investigating a series of calls similar to this one, only the caller was targeting Wendy's in that area. Detective Flaherty was able to trace the calling cards and determine the exact time and place it was purchased, which was Walmart. However, that particular Walmart didn't have security cameras at the registers and did not capture who purchased the calling card. So Detective Stump and Detective Flaherty began working the case together. And they caught a break when they discovered that Officer Scott had made a huge mistake. He purchased the calling card that he used to call Louise's McDonald's at a different Walmart. And this time the cameras caught him. They now had a face, but unfortunately no name. So they went back and reviewed the first security footage. And though they didn't have footage of him purchasing the cards there, they were able to match him in both videos. And that's when they realized that the man was wearing a uniform in the first video, which ended up being a huge break in their case. This uniform had a logo on it for Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA. And CCA is a private prison company located in Panama City. This told them that he most likely worked there. From there, CCA's warden was able to identify the man in the video, and now detectives had a name to go with the face which turned out to be a man named David Stewart. We'll talk more about this man in just a second, but first I want to address what happened to Donna and Walter after this incident occurred. Walter obviously knew what he was doing was wrong, so why would he proceed and do it anyway just because someone told him to? At what point does someone's knowledge of right and wrong kick in so that they stop doing whatever they're told to do, even if it's under someone else's authority, like a police officer? Any adult with an average or slightly below average IQ would absolutely know that they shouldn't be doing this, even if a cop told them to. Thankfully, Walter was immediately arrested and charged with sexual abuse and unlawful imprisonment, which he pled guilty to. Because he agreed to testify against the caller, he only received a five-year sentence, which he ultimately served two years for. Donna obviously broke off their engagement and never spoke to Walter again. She reviewed the security footage of the night of the assault and got to witness exactly what happened with her own eyes. In regards to Donna, McDonald's obviously terminated her employment for going against company policy and performing a strip search, but that would prove to be the least of her worries. She was later arrested for unlawful imprisonment. She ultimately entered an Alford plea and Donna was sentenced to one year of probation. All right, let's talk about who Officer Scott really was. The man on the other end of the phone was 38-year-old David Stewart. He was a Florida resident who was married and had five young children. 
I wasn't able to find a lot of information about his personal life, but we do know that he was working as a corrections officer. When police finally searched his home, they found an insane amount of evidence that Stewart desperately wanted to be a police officer, but most likely didn't have the skills to do so. They found multiple job applications to police departments and all of the accessories that a police officer would have. He had police type uniforms, firearms and ammo, and literally hundreds of police magazines. Of course, none of this indicates that he did this, right? Police also recovered multiple calling cards in his home that they were able to link back to various calls in other states, but unfortunately not the card that was used in the Mount Washington case. David Stewart was arrested for impersonating a police officer and solicitation of sodomy and was extradited from Florida to Kentucky. However, Stewart was able to hire a good attorney and was eventually acquitted of all charges in October of 2006, basically because all of the evidence was circumstantial. His attorney argued that just because he purchased the calling cards doesn't mean that he was the one that used them. I do think it should be noted that since David was arrested, there have been no more prank calls of this nature. So there's that. Louise sadly had a long road ahead of her. After this incident, she began therapy and was diagnosed with PTSD and depression. She unfortunately abandoned her plans to go to college and found it very difficult to recover from what happened to her. She basically felt like she could never open up to anyone again. She's currently still in therapy and sued McDonald's about three years later. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. I have to say though, I really feel for this woman. There has been so much victim blaming going on because people don't understand why she continued to follow what she was being told and didn't make many attempts to get out of the situation she was in. It's easy to say, I would have ran out of there naked and screamed for help if you're not in that situation. I think that's a trash thought process and disgusting that anyone would have expected her to do that. Louise was lured into the office under the authority of her manager, which none of us would think much of. As soon as she was in there, there really was no escaping at that point. There were people constantly guarding her, even if she wasn't completely mortified by the idea of 50 strangers seeing her nude. I don't look at that situation any differently than I would any other assault case, and I don't understand how or why other people do. She was literally backed into a corner. There is security footage that has since been released to the public, which I find absolutely disgusting, and it makes me feel for her even more. Imagine being assaulted at work in such a degrading way and having it aired on 2020 a few years later. It was discovered that McDonald's was aware of the hoax phone calls and was actually being sued in four separate states for incidents that occurred two years prior. Yet they took no precautions to stop it from happening again. Apparently, their corporate office did send out memos to their franchises, but it was up to the owners to relay the information to the employees, which was simply not done. I'm sorry, but if you already have numerous lawsuits against you for similar incidents, why would you not send out multiple memos demanding that this information be relayed? Why would you not put it in your training? Because McDonald's knew this was happening and did nothing to protect their employees, Louise sued them for $200 million. McDonald's basically came back and said that because the incidents were not performed by another McDonald's employee and Louise never tried to remove herself from the situation, that they shouldn't have to pay. They claimed that it was common sense for her to try and leave. The civil trial lasted for approximately one month and Louise was awarded $6.1 million. But that wouldn't be the last of the money that McDonald's would have to pay out. Because get this. Donna Summers also sued McDonald's for not warning her about the hoaxes, blaming them for her lack of common sense, I suppose. <laughs> she asked for $50 million and was actually awarded $1.1 million after the jury decided that Walter Nix was responsible in addition to McDonald's. The company was also sanctioned because they withheld evidence that was pertinent to the civil trial and they drug these lawsuits on for as long as they possibly could to the point that they were ordered to pay an additional $2.4 million in legal fees because they were purposely dragging it out with multiple appeals. 
All right, now that we have all the information, what do you guys think of this case? Who do you think was ultimately responsible for the abuse that Luis had to suffer through? I'm guessing that there are gonna be some different opinions on this one. Do you think that David Stewart was the person behind the calls? Obviously, Officer Scott should be partially to blame. He placed the phone calls with the intent to coerce people to do things that he wanted to be doing. I think part of it was thrilling for him because he so desperately wanted to be a police officer and had people conform and do what he wanted them to do. He wanted to be taken seriously and be respected. However, I think that the perversion that he was carrying within overruled his ego. I'm very curious to know exactly why he wasn't able to secure a job on a police force, despite the many applications that he put in. What was holding them back from hiring him? So hypothetically, if David Stewart is the person making these calls, they started with him. But he was only successful because people followed his direction and carried out these acts. Should they be held accountable as well? Or do you think that the only way that someone would fall for something like this is if they had something perverse or strange within themselves and they simply let their true color shine through? There have been many studies done on things like this and psychologists claim how easy it is to conform in a situation like this when you believe you're being guided by somebody of authority. I could understand this happening once, twice, or even three times, but over 70 different cases, there are some circumstances where someone would be more susceptible to falling for something like this. Some people are more trusting. Some people have lower IQs, but 70 cases? At what point when you're hurting another person because someone told you to, do you stop and say to yourself, this is wrong, I know better than this. Who is this person to tell me to do something against what I believe in? I guess I don't understand how Walter Nix, who despite having a lower IQ, according to his lawyer, is able to work as an exterminator and live a normal life. The same goes for Donna. She was the assistant store manager. I'm not saying it takes a genius to run a McDonald's, but you think she possessed some common sense. How do these people fall into this trap? But then Tommy the janitor walked into the situation and decided this was not right within 60 seconds. I guess I just don't understand because I couldn't imagine doing these things. Especially because someone over the phone told me to. Even if a real police officer instructed me to do something like this, I just can't imagine being like, yeah, okay, I'll get right on that and then just go about my business like nothing happened. Walter did show remorse and believe that what he did was wrong. So why didn't he speak up and do something about it in the first place? Why didn't he say, I'm not gonna do that. If you need this to be done, carry yourself to McDonald's and do it yourself and hang up. Why didn't that happen? I'll never understand. So who do you think is responsible? McDonald's, the caller? Donna, Walter, the other employees that stood by and did nothing? Let me know in the comments, but please be respectful to Louise. Like I said earlier, there's a movie called Compliance that showcases what happened if you want to check it out, though it is an uncomfortable movie. I believe there's also an episode on Law & Order SVU that's loosely based on this as well. I'm honestly so happy that she was awarded the money she received, though no amount of money will take away the trauma from that day. But that's all I got for you today, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you have a case suggestion, go ahead and click the link in the description or send me an email. Either is fine. Thank you again for watching, and as always, remember the name, Casey Shane. I'm out.